corporate greed, naive explorers, monstrous mysteries. Okay, I've got this mic going. Vincula's recorder is... Oh, uh, yeah, that's not going to be working again anytime soon. Aren't these things supposed to be rated for falls over 30 meters? That was more like 10. Hey, at least that wasn't Cassie's fault. Well, I'm surprised. You don't seem like you've sustained any injuries. When that thing flew out of the sky at you and landed on your shoulders, I thought for sure I'd either be putting you back together Humpty Dumpty style or suturing some nasty bites. Did, did anyone get a good look at it? I only saw the wings beating behind me. It had leathery wings like a bat's, and the shape of its head was really odd, elongated, kind of like, mm, like, like a goat's head? I couldn't make out much else. Oh, even better. Nearly got chomped by a vampire bat goat. Huh. Okay, I've had a moment to think, and I don't think that was its nest. Otherwise, it would have returned by now, most likely. Maybe it thought I was trying to take over its scavenging site, but it was just hit and run. So odd. Oh, oh, look at, look at this. Look at this. I don't see anything. Jeremiah, are you quite sure they're all right? That's the point. You don't see anything. Stick your hand out here. Uh, okay. Ah! Oh! Oh! That... that's strange. It it feels like a ball of steel wool. But I can't... I can't see it. I just feel it. Wait, if I get really close, I can see the strands. Uh, Only when I move them around, though. Let me see, let me see! Oh, me next! Remember those screams the other day? Saw a lot of blurs, but no creatures, yeah? They must be covered in this fur? Somehow, it's able to project the image of what's behind it. But that would require a great degree of control over every single hair. Or is it simply translucent? But then, how would the creature's body be invisible? (laughs) This is fascinating. Only one way to get to the bottom of this mystery. Let's get that little tuft of fur bagged away. We are headed back to the lab. Oh, we're headed back now? I figured you'd want to stick out the rest of the day. We have just about half our time remaining. Science waits for no one. We have a groundbreaking discovery to analyze. And my, if I'm not feeling faint after my close call. We gotta head back right away. Ah, I see. Let's pack it up. It's breach or bust. Recorders are hunks of junk. Greg can vouch for me. The climb was barely 10 meters high, well within the limits of decent equipment. And I can't predict when a creature is going to decide to take issue with our presence, all right? Ugh. From all current observations, it looks like we are barely starting to get an accurate headcount of all the creatures living in the breach world. But I can't, in good conscience, continue risking lives without better equipment. If you can't, then I'm certain Vinkula can find someone who will. Better equipment. Indeed, equipment of any kind is increasingly difficult to find anyway. Shortages from the pandemic continue to affect supply, even for projects such as this. You're going to have to make do, Cassius, and stop placing such risks upon yourself and your charges, both material and manpower. Those risks are calculated and paying off tremendously for us thus far. We have samples from dozens of species already, ranging from simple new genus of plant life to this. The first concrete evidence of our invisible friends, threads of biological origin with what appear to be nerve endings embedded in the core of each hair. This animal seems to be capable of making itself blend into virtually any environment. And we're just getting started with our exploration, Miss Vo. Mr. Richardson was pleased by your findings today, of course. It is for that reason you are still in leadership of the Breacher team. I am to congratulate you. <laughs> However. Oh, boy. Vincula would like to remind you of the safety briefing held earlier this week and the stipulations you agreed to. 
Please take exceptional care of Vinculus property, employees, and Vinculus time. Your trip today was cut short, and your reasons for returning are flimsy at best. We need as many samples and records made as possible in the time allotted for these expeditions. This is not a private safari, Thatcher. Now then, I am pleased to inform you all that the Breachers have been tasked with the naming of the Breach World. You're free to use any designation you'd like. Within reason. Whatever would be less of a mouthful than the Breach World would be most welcome for the sake of the paperwork. Yay! Yay! Ah, an exciting opportunity. Oh, and I've got a list here for you, Cassius. A list? Your exploits in the Breach thus far have been useful for our biochemical analysis teams. They have checked your records for exploration and devised a list of samples they are requesting for study. These sample requests are in addition to finding Specimen 1 or any remaining evidence of it or its civilization, if any remain at all. You may collect these as time and your search patterns allow, but I would like to draw special attention to this particular article. Let's see. More scales, CO2 measurements... Fallen breechwood tree samples. Water from the acid springs. That's a surprising request. And you want this especially because... Why, your safety is paramount, of course. Our researchers suggest if there is a potential for any eruption or other tectonic activity, samples from subterranean water tables may assist us with detecting such problems. Uh Uh-huh. Well, we do have hazmat suits available to us, finally. I suppose we can take care of that tomorrow. Excellent. Please make that material a priority as you collect the other articles on the list. With that, I will leave you to your specimen labeling. I look forward to hearing your naming decision by tomorrow at the pre-journey briefing. Yes, we'll have it ready. Sheesh. Miss Vo really seems to enjoy using your last name when she's chastising you, Cassius. Is there some bad blood about the thatch, um, about, um, your surname? I don't want to really get into it. I'd rather not be affiliated with my family and their actions, is all. Yes, she does enjoy throwing the capital T legal name around when she's doing that thing she does when she's dressing us down. Ah, I didn't mean to pry. I'll drop the subject. (sighs) Appreciated. So, what's their reasoning on some of these? And why is the water important? We've been waiting for the money side of Vincula to drop. Maybe they're planning on opening a resort once they find out the lake's composition? I mean, it's a bit of a strange thing to move up on the priority list. We don't have any information about how the Breach world works. I'm sure they're just looking for as much data about the planet inside the Breach as possible, Although, a hot spring in the breach wood sounds pretty nice as a vacation spot. Uh, I really hope I'm not right about the resort thing. It'd be terrible seeing pristine wilderness torn up for parking lots and strip malls. Life's a journey, and don't worry, you'll find a parking spot in the end. Looks like Vincula may be the one paving paradise. If they can get around the man-sized bats. I don't think the bat creature was that big. Maybe more like half the size of a human. Really hard to tell precisely, though. It was flapping so energetically, and I was a little distracted with Cassius's safety. That was really creepy looking. I thought for sure when I saw it latch onto Cassius's back, it was going to make you fall, or, or bite you, or... I'm not sure what all, but I'm glad we all made it back safe. <sighs> Me too. I have to know what happens in the next installment of Symbol Forge. The game's not supposed to come out in the States until next year. That's so far away. Ah, there it is. Forget about our hides. We need to know what our favorite video game characters are doing next year. Back to business. We have to have a name for the Breach World picked out by tomorrow. So let that be the first order of business before we finish cataloging today's samples. Ooh, ooh, how about Breachwood Land? Hmm. That sounds like a theme park. I'm not a fan. I think we have to make this sound a bit snappy, like Earth or Mars. And we're not sure if the whole place is covered in Breachwood Forest or not anyways, Alex. Right. Right. 
I kind of want a name that's like Mother Earth. I'm not sure how we could shorten that. Spanish, maybe? Madre Tierra? Still two words. We could. Oh, here he comes, Mr. I know Latin himself. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead, Silas. We could borrow a naming convention from astronomers and use a Greek deity, the one personifying life and Earth. Her name was Gaia. Hmm. Gaia. I like that immediately. Real short and has the Mother Nature vibe I was hoping for. It has a nice ring to it, for sure. There's Bigfoots and trees and a weird ziggurat. Hmm. Maybe Denver. Den- <coughs> No. <laughs> We might have to ban Alex from the naming society. All right. All in favor of Gaia? That's three for it, Alex. Clear majority. Man, cheer up, Alex. Maybe next time we should all get a say in some of the names. After all, we're all on this team together. Oh, if there's one thing we're going to need lots of, apparently it's names. If blue-footed boobies can be an acceptable name, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to use some of Alex's names. Now that that's out of the way, on to the real shit. Look at this bad boy under the microscope. Is this another joke because you can't actually see anything? Not anymore. We got some dye to stick to the fibers and dried out the residue. You can see the individual filaments. Oh, this I gotta see! Let me take a peek here! We have different parts of the bundle of fur going out for further analysis, but the nerve endings contained in the hairs themselves are indicative of some kind of sensory aspect to their nature. It's possible they're able to detect their surroundings and alter the hair's coloration accordingly. If this is from the same creature we encountered screaming at us around the unilope warren, that means the hair's control is extensive enough to render them basically invisible, even while on the move. Impressive! The coloration is so swift, all that's perceptible to human eyes is a brief haze. That's my current hypothesis, anyways. Ooh, it looks like it maintains those properties even after detachment! What is the mechanism for the color change? Are these hairs pigmented? We'll have to study what we've got and try to find more samples, and hopefully locate live specimens for observation. They've gotten the drop on us a time or two already, but with study will come answers. Maybe we can find some ways to circumvent their invisibility and detect them at range. This may account for visual observation, but I wonder if infrared detection would still work. It's the right thickness and the follicles are the correct shape for it to be gorilla hair, or closely related. That too. That goes with our prior theory about these creatures being apes or ape-like. So, with that in mind, I'd like to give these creatures a tentative name. We'll have to obtain better data on their biological makeup before we can settle for certain, but I'm willing to give them a placeholder. Bigfoot, obviously. Uh, we've thrown that name around a lot, but I don't think that'll stick for their common name. We don't have any obvious connection to this creature and the mythic being from the Rocky Mountains. Yet. Their hair changes color to keep them camouflaged, so I was thinking chameleic ape? Like, the chameleon? For their common name. We can settle on a scientific name later. It does allude to their hidden nature, doesn't it? That's pretty good. Chameleic ape. I rather like it too. I'll give you one more shot at it, Alex, if you want. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. How about... See... See through Ithacus. Uh... Denied. Fourth expedition log for Vincula. The breachers have returned to the site of the sky blue acid springs. Cassius is preparing to suit up in hazmat gear for specimen collection, just in case the springs happen to be filled with volatile chemicals rather than harmless compounds found in terrestrial springs. All right, that's most of the suit. Greg, give me a hand with the helmet attachment. <sighs> Damn, this thing is so hot. Cassius? What is it, Elizabeth? What... 
What? Why are you asking me something after I made a comment about the heat? I just think we ought to practice some restraint. Ugh, hot restraint? Elizabeth, what are you talking about? I think we should wait. I, I, I think we should wait. Wait for what exactly? I'm certain I saw something the other day. Breaking up the lake surface. I think patience worked for us before, and it can work for us again. We sat and watched the nests, and we should observe this lake for a short time before we approach. <sighs> all right, all right. We'll wait a couple minutes before I go in for sample collection. But I'm not getting back out of this suit, and I'm not roasting in it either. I'm headed for the tree line for some shade, and when it becomes unbearable, which will be soon, by the way, I'm going in. Told you they can be reasoned with. I didn't expect that to work, to be honest. Well, time to see if I've been too much of a scaredy cat all along. Can you really be too much of a scaredy cat in a place like this? On Gaia, I should say? My opinion? Absolutely not. We've been relying on daytime hours to keep us safe. But if we encountered those nocturnal predators somewhere in the wild during our search, who's to say daylight would protect us? And that's to say nothing of anything we've seen since then. If that bat had been given to hematophagia, would we have been able to help Cassius at all? No, I think not. Man, you are pretty dramatic, just like Cassius says. Oh, do they? Yes, they do. Interesting. <sighs> I have been a bit of a Debbie Downer, I think is what Cassius described. This isn't a recent occurrence for me, though. I can't help but be plagued by thoughts of death. It's followed me around for as long as I can remember. Yeah, I kind of thought the overly dramatic responses were just in reaction to the first few days here, but that's kind of just Silas, isn't it? Unfortunately, yes, that's me. I could spend hours at a time thinking about the various ways we could all meet untimely ends. Like, how about a flock of those bats coming down and sucking us down to the last drop of marrow? We don't even know if they are blood drinkers, Silas. Only a few species of Earth's bats are. How about getting cornered by the chameleon ape again? A big pack of them, pulling our limbs out of their sockets, slowly, painfully. Nah, that would never happen. Cassius got us out of the last time we were cornered, and if we really need it, Greg's got our backs with some firepower. Well, you must admit then, there could be a monster so gargantuan, we'd be powerless to stop it from gobbling each and every one of us up. Imagine its head, towering over the tops of the trees, something waiting out in the breech woods, ready to stride out on titanic legs, rending the earth with every step and then plucking us up like delicious little treats in its house-sized hands. A beast of that size, while it could exist, in theory, is unlikely to be hiding in plain sight like that. And if it was that large, I doubt it would be very interested in tiny morsels like us. And finally, if all those things were true, then there wouldn't be much we could do about it anyways. Yeah, exactly! Wait, what? Not much we can do about it. That's where my fatalism stems from, I think. You can run from it, take preventive measures, stave it off with technology. But so far, we are beholden to an end. Death arrives, whether you like it or not. Shouldn't that be freeing, then? Like, there's nothing wrong with trying to avoid death, right? So... You do your best, and when it happens, it happens. That way you can spend your time thinking about living rather than dying. Hmm. I guess I've always placed emphasis on the manner of my death adding meaning to my life. As if going out in a dignified way would add a measure of gravitas to the miserable scrabbling we call existence. That sounds stuffy as all get out. Like those old oil paintings where the subject portrayed as dying in bed and a crowd of people are gathered around, all torn up with grief. Oh, I could see that being a classic one day. The death of Silas Caldwell. 
oil on a canvas. Here we see a distraught Silas in no particular danger, griping about death anyway. The rest of his team look on in pity. In the painting, the team is, in fact, surrounded by comedic apes, but are unaware of their presence. Cassius can be seen cackling with glee in the background. It is unknown if they are laughing at the presence of the apes or at Silas's predicament. <laughs> <laughs> I think, if I had to choose, I wouldn't want anyone to see me die at all. Might even be easier if I was gobbled up, you know? Just... Have a little vase of flowers to remember me by. And at the funeral, everyone can think about how I lived and how much fun we had. Instead of thinking about how it ended. Nice and neat finish for Alex Yard. That's drastic sounding. You'd rather die alone than burden anyone else with the grisly business of your death arrangements? <laughs> it sounds silly, but it's just how I think about it. I don't want to go that way, but if it's a choice between this overwrought thing with hand wringing and tears flowing, and just a quick... <clears throat> I know what I'd pick. If I do make it to a ripe old age of... <sighs> hmm... Like, past 30... Ugh. And, you know, my time comes... I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be allowed to die alone anyway. <laughs> My older siblings would be flocking from across the country. Mom and Dad would even leave their beloved mountain cabin way out in the middle of nowhere to come see me. If they were still around, too. Come to think of it, I actually did almost die alone. Wait, really? Yeah. I was like... 16 or so. My dad was stationed in Alaska, way out in the middle of the state. Not much civilization out there. Oh, it was beautiful, though. I love the purple splashes the sun made on the mountains near Denali, the pristine white snow in the winter, and you haven't lived until you see the auroras. But, yeah. I was pretty young and exploring the forest near our house. I wasn't, like, being bad. I stayed pretty close to the house. I was having a blast, listening to my boots just go crunch, crunch, crunch on the light-packed snow. The only sound out there. If I stopped, the forest just stilled, the little faint echoes of my steps fading like a dying breath. I didn't even notice my phone because I had silenced it to listen. Mom saw on TV a freak storm was coming and was trying to get me to come back home. It doesn't actually snow too much in Alaska. It's a really dry state when you're that far inland like we were. What you have to worry about in parts of Alaska are the winds and the temperature. When there's hurricane-force gales, it'll kick the snow up off the ground and blind you, and it only takes minutes to freeze. The last gasps of the wood had turned into a howling shriek of icy madness. I lost track of where I was. The snow being kicked up by the gusts meant I could barely see a few feet in front of me, and I couldn't find my house. Dad had shown us how to try and survive in the Arctic, so I tried to make a little shelter, but I couldn't get it to withstand the sheer force of the storm. I sat next to a tree and could feel myself getting really sleepy. I was so cold. My eyes latched onto a shape in the driving blizzard. Huge blending into the snow, blasting all around me. But there were three little dark points a short distance in front of me, staring at me. What was left of the warmth in my body left me when I realized it was a polar bear, or what I thought was a polar bear. They don't come this far south, I thought. They mostly hang around the Arctic Circle, right? I, maybe it was a grizzly bear covered with snow, but... Even against the gray haze of the blizzard, it stood out with its whiteness. I just made my peace then. Maybe if I could keep this majestic creature alive when it ate me, it would all be fine after all. <laughs> I was pretty numb, in body and mind by then, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> but it started shuffling closer. Great big paws crushing the snow underfoot. I could only sit and watch as it drew near. 
I felt no fear anymore, just a kind of pang at my loss. But it was dull. The bear's huge head alone looked like it was bigger than my whole self. It leaned down close to me and let out a few big snorts. The winds kept howling around us and it seemed to pause and just think for a second. Then it leaned its head down and just waited. I felt like I was being beckoned silently. Just this big old bear neck, rough fur caked in snow. I reached out and grabbed onto it. It kind of half lifted, half dragged me along with it. I still wasn't convinced this was like salvation or anything. Maybe bizarrely it was having me help it take me to somewhere to munch on. I don't know how much time passed. I lost all sensation after being carried along for a while. I dreamed about gripping onto a rope for dear life while the wind screamed all around me. When I came to, I was in the emergency room getting warmed up, and Mom was an absolute mess. Dad had taken off with a couple of rescuers into the woods, but they ended up finding me on their way back, all crumpled up and mostly frozen a short distance from our own back door. They all chalked my bear story up to hypothermia, said my brain was freezing over and being hyperactive with its imagination, probably. Oh, and I wasn't allowed to go anywhere for the longest time, up until I went to college for physics, really. And even then, you bet I got daily phone checkups. That's fascinating. Oh, wow. I'm glad you're still with us in the land of the living. I can understand your family being so attached, especially when you were so near death. Still, must have been rough being so, you know, watched so carefully all the time afterwards. Yeah, I'm the youngest, so never had much of a chance to get away from anything when I wanted, before or after the storm incident. This has been my first opportunity to just be me, as I am without being defined by where I sit on a familial totem pole. I've had to be so careful with my letters back home. Miss Vo censors them, but I don't want to even give the teeniest hint I might be in danger here. They'd have a bunch of the yards banging on the gates trying to break me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny to think about Miss Vo getting stampeded by this little gaggle of people looking for Alex. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that when writing my own letters. I don't think my mother would even believe I was doing anything remotely dangerous. For all my morbid daydreaming, I do prefer staying alive, and the company of my books and stories to a rough-and-tumble life. But this hasn't been altogether a terrible experience. I'm sure one day people will read about our exploits and look back on them, like how you read about Arctic expeditions. Sure, conditions were harsh, the journey long, there were polar bears and all manner of dangers, but we're richer in our knowledge of nature for it. Can you imagine little kids, years from now, reading about the Camelic apes, hearing a wizened British voice on TV talking about their perches in the breech woods? Here we see Lepis Uni, the unilope, in its natural environment. The bucks thump loudly to alert the warren to imminent danger. They must keep a close eye on the skies for predators and... Alex? Alex, quick, pass me the binoculars! But... Okay, but I don't see anything in the lake. Elizabeth has her gaze trained upward. Uh, I can barely make out a speck up there? Is that? Oh, the as he is. We've got a visitor. What you see, Elizabeth? There's something out there. <laughs> up there. Your friends from earlier have come back for seconds. What? Here, give me the field glasses. Just above the tallest breech wood, opposite the clearing from us. That's definitely bat-like. Ugh. The wings are featherless. It just looks like stretched out skin. Is that... Ugh. Ew. Is that a horse head? Okay. Could... You thought the same as me. Ugh. That's one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. That is one ugly mother humper. Do you hear that? Ugh. That's the same sound it made. That critter must be of the same species as yesterday's unwanted guest. 
Ugh, I am so glad I did not turn around to get a good look at it. That horse head does not belong on that large bat body. It looks like it's flapping its wings real hard to stay up there, too. If it's got a horse head, does it have horse teeth, too? Maybe it's a herbivore, after all? <laughs> no telling, though. That jaw could open up and reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth. Uh, Cassius? Cassius, the lake is changing! What? What now? Yeah, out in the center. You don't even need the binox to see. There's a black patch on the lake. I see it. When did that get there? The lake has been pure blue the whole time, right? Until this very moment, yes! Was that... in... reaction? It's diving, I repeat. Critter's taking a dive. A horse bat is swooping towards the lake. Why? Oh, it's headed for that black patch that appeared. What's it trying to do? Whoa! Hey. Oh! Sweet mother. Cassius? Elizabeth? What? What was that thing? I have no fucking idea. I'm, I'm gonna have to agree. Holy hell, did you see how its neck shot out of the water? Acid Nessie just snapped Horsebat right out of the air! Poor thing. Forget Acid Nessie. That creature is more like Acid Leviathan. Its neck must have gone, what, halfway up the tree line? And the rest of it was still in the water. Did that look like a reptile or like a dinosaur to you as well, Elizabeth? It was very reminiscent of illustrations I've seen of a plesiosaur, but with jet black scales. But the way its neck shot up almost looked like it was coiled. Like a spring that was being let loose. So fast. I don't know anything that works like that. Not on that scale. I, uh... I owe you one, Elizabeth. If I hadn't waited, we never would have spotted it. The, I, I wouldn't have stood a chance if that was aimed at me. Oh my god. No, it's fine. No, I mean, yeah, you're fine, is what I mean. You're fine. Th thank goodness. Shooey! If I blinked, I'd have missed it. I take it that means our little lake piss bottle collection mission can wait, hopefully forever? Yeah, we aren't messing with that. Hell no. Vinkula can get stuffed on this one. Let's complete our loop searching for specimen one and head back. And get me out of this suit. Here she comes. Make sure you get this. I understand you were unsuccessful in acquiring the priority samples today. <sighs> no, we did not get any water samples. The presence of a monstrously large carnivorous animal in the lake prevented us from- Vincula understood dangerous assignments to be your specialty. Were there no alternatives explored? Did you try to find more sources of spring water? We continued our search pattern, looking for specimen one, but didn't find any other pooled groundwater areas. Why do you continue to waste our time? We gave you clear instructions, and so far, none of your most pressing objectives have been met. You're welcome to get anyone else to try and get your damn spring water, Vo. If there had been a feasible way to acquire it, it would have already been done. But given the danger present on site and the lack of other sites, we don't have the means to get your precious sample. Other avenues will be explored. I know what I'm doing. Prove it, Thatcher. We await results. God damn. That was bullshit. What do you what do you expect me to do? Walking the breacher team into the jaws of Titan Nessie isn't going to get anyone closer to a water sample. And why is it so important anyways? What's the deal? I mean, maybe there's something important we don't know, Cassius. Water from a spring can provide us with a lot of data about geological activity. Like the analysis team said. Maybe they're afraid of volcanoes? Alex, I don't believe for a second. Given Vo's reaction just now, it's purely a safety issue anymore. Not after that chewing out. You're looking grumpy again, Silas, and I see you chewing your lip over there. What are you thinking? Well, it's just that I'm remembering the other time Vincula asked me to do a chore with water. 
They didn't even hesitate to send me into the breach with the link stone and the salt water. And I still have over a dozen more link stones in my office with untranslated sigils on them. Right. There's more link stones other than the one we used to get through the breach. Could that mean there's a way to retool the breach? Use different link stones to get different destinations? Are there more breaches somewhere in this facility? Is Vinculus sitting on a bunch of them just waiting to go, oops, forgot to mention these? What else are they hiding from us? I haven't explored enough of the facility to be sure, but it seems unlikely. The breach containment lab is quite expansive, and it'd be hard, if not impossible, to hide as many breaches as we have stones. Although, I'm sure there's room for at least one or two more labs, if they even had more breaches after all. Still, I don't have any additional information on that, and we have no leads about the other link stones for now. My translation work continues. I don't know how you'd go about altering the sigil in the breach anyway. It looks like you need to match the stone's sigil with the breach's sigil, and then have the correct... Uh, offering? In this case, it was salt water. But the other stones have different sigils. Okay, that's all good to know. I want to try and keep track of all these pieces coming together. So, the idea of more breaches going hand-in-hand hand with all the extra link stones we've got sounds likely for why they need this so suddenly. <laughs> Volcanic activity, my ass. There's an agenda here they refuse to explain. I mean, if there are more worlds needing exploring, it's good that we're doing this, right? It saves us a lot of hiking if we have an expansive collection of materials to try. I don't appreciate being left in the dark about the details. I'm on board with the exploration, the sample collecting, the work we've been doing so far. There's clear rules for being as non-invasive as possible, and the blackout means we won't have a lot of sightseers trying to poke around Gaia. But Vincula is acting so purposefully with bits of this mission. I just, I wish I understood what it was they were aiming for. It, it can't be good. It's probably just the same old corporate song and dance. They gotta find ways to monetize the findings, and I'm sure they're facing federal pressure to handle this exploration in a safe, but also expedient manner. Fast and safe never make good bedfellows. Do we have anything at our disposal that might help us? We have one drone left over from the nighttime unmanned explorations. We're working on getting more, but this is all that's left for now. We could... We could rig it with sample bottle and try to float it down to the lake. Titan Nessie looked like its reflexes were way too fast to pull that off. I mean, I'm willing to give it a try on our next outing. If Fingula wants their sample so damn fast, we'll have to try something. These things are pretty quick, yeah? I've had a little practice before, and flown this one around outside Vincula quite a bit, just for fun. I don't know if we can outrace the monster, but I'm willing to give it a shot. I don't have high hopes for it either, but I may have a backup plan, just in case. Something about Elizabeth's earlier observations on the data we recorded Lakeside is standing out to me. And I have a hunch. Oh dear. Care to share with the rest of the class, Cassius? Trade secret, Silas. Let's see if our drone idea pans out, and I'll explain more tomorrow. Ominous. I do hope those documents I signed earlier didn't include a linguist disposability clause. I wish it had included a linguist mute clause, if anything. I could just go like this and- hey. Fifth expedition log for Vincula. Once again, the breacher team is at the site of the acid lake, now known to be the habitat of the large predator, tentative common name, Titan Plesiosaur. Alex has the controls of Vincula's drone and is going to carefully attempt to lower the drone over the lake with the collection bottle fastened securely by twine to the drone's body. Fingers crossed. Take her away, Alex. Good luck, little guy. First, let's try a high altitude approach. I'm curious to see if we can get the same reaction from the Titan Plesiosaur as the horseback got yesterday. There it is! The black spot on the lake! Bait lily pad spotted! I assume that confirms your idea of its behavior being an airborne creature predator? Pending further observation, of course, but yes. So far, so good. That's how hypotheses work, my dear linguist. You're learning so fast. 
All right, Alex, try to get closer to the other end of the lake, away from Acid Nessie. I'm curious if it'll attempt to follow the drone's movement. Roger that, Mission Control. Read you loud and clear. Oh, now you're just having too much fun over there. Stay focused. Keep your finger on the ascent stick, Alex. You'll need to get out of there real fast if it's interested in the drone. Here it comes! Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Sheesh! Close flying there. Nice! You got the drone away in time. Okay, one more time. Go for a low approach this time. That was too close for comfort, but hey, this is kind of fun! Focus! Oh, right. Woohoo! Hmm, okay, that didn't work either. It is having to keep its neck trajectory high and waiting for the drone to approach over the lake water. I don't think it wants to shoot its head over the land. Maybe trying to reach over land is painful for it? Doesn't take it long to recoil, though. You can see a definite spiral in its neck. I'm, I'm almost positive it's having to coil its neck up and stretch it out like a compression spring. Then it whips its head back into the water, probably to coil back up again. I'm noticing, but I don't think the drone has enough maneuverability to get back to the water in time. Alright, it's time for plan C. Don't you mean plan B? Nope. Plan Cassius. Give me a hand with this, Greg. Are you really? You really are! You're running in there, aren't you? You... you can't be serious. Cassius, really, this is far too dangerous. It's like Vo said, Silas. I'm the dangerous mission expert, so it's my job to get it done. Let's not waste time. It's another scorcher today, and I don't want to bake in this suit any longer than I have to. This is... this is stupid! All over some spring water? A life is far more valuable to this team than some precious sample for Vincula. Silas, I'm gonna be fine. It's gonna be like a shot at the doc's office. In and out, don't even look, super quick. I'll come back, I promise. Uh, I- Boldly going where no one has gone before. All right, Alex, take the drone down and get the lily pad to show up. I'm gonna approach, and you've gotta bait the Titan Plesiosaur's attack. Once it sticks out its neck, I'm running to the lakeshore and getting our sample. Don't let me down. Oh. Uh, okay. I'll do my best. You got this, Alex. We're pulling for both of you. Mm, here it comes. Go, go, go. Be quick. Come on. Come on. Faster. Bring her down, Alex. They're at the edge. They're dipping the bottle. Come on, Cassius. Damn the drone. Bring it down again, Alex. I'm trying! Stay calm. You got this. Uh, run it back, run it back, run it back! You're halfway back! No, don't trip now! No, no! I got its attention. It's going for the drone. Yeah, that's right, you son of a bitch. Snap that drone and get nothing but air. They're back on their feet! Yes, yes, they made it! Woo! Yeah! yeah and it's yes! good! <sighs> Fucking heavy ass slip rubber suit got me slipping and sliding. Okay, okay. I talk the big talk, but it's so freaking huge when you're standing right next to it. That was terrifying. Shit. Great hustle out there. <laughs> that was stupid as hell, but you got it done, I assume. I got it. I got it right here. I almost dropped the stupid thing when I tripped. Here, carefully. This is my life in your hands. Get that jar in the styrofoam bin. I will tolerate no jostling of these contents. No jostling. Straight in record storage it goes. I still can't believe you pulled that shit off. Like, what the hell, dude? I thought you were fish food. You... You did it. Holy crap. All in a day's work for... <laughs> friggin' Vingula's finest, I guess. Alright, let's get this operation back home. Elizabeth, you got that stowed away? Perfect. Alex, can you bring the drone back? Alex? Lovely... Lovely wings. Graceful in the moonlight. Alex? Hey, Alex, snap out of it. Alex, hey, come on. What's going on? Talk to me. Is that... a moth? It's so... beautiful.
Syntax is a podcast by Twin Strangers Productions and is licensed under an attribution share alike 4.0 international license. Today's episode was directed and produced by Stella Odom and written by Ty Vaughn. Silas Caldwell is played by Ty Vaughn. Cassius Thatcher is played by Beth Fung. Elizabeth Bellinger is played by Morgie B. Alex Yard is played by Jules Christine. Greg Washburn is played by Cody Burke. Jeremiah Woods is played by Eldrin Smith. Miss Evelyn Vo is played by Kyla Crockett. Listen to other episodes, find our social media links, and make donations by visiting syntaxpodcast.com. Rate us on iTunes and Google Podcast, and follow us on Spotify. Tweet us at TwinStrangersP with your burning questions and engage with fellow listeners on our subreddit, r slash syntaxpod. Thanks for listening.